Put your hands together for the great band, a tremendous praise and worship. Now let's clap our hands for a great God, a mighty God, a powerful, incredible God. Hallelujah! Something's about to happen in this place. Shift, 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 shift in my life. Shift, shift in my family. Shift, shift. Give three people a high five. Say shift. Shift, 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 shift. shift. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Amen, 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 amen. Amen. <laughs> amen. Join hands with somebody right now. Amen. Father, we thank you for your anointing tonight. You are going to shift major things in our lives. We pray three blessings. The first one on the apostle of this house, his wife and family and their leadership. Secondly, we pray a blessing on all those leaders, pastors that have come, that you would impart life and blessing into their lives. And thirdly, we pray blessing on every woman, every man every young man, every young woman, every family, that our lives would be shifted and changed forever in the name of Jesus. Bless the person on my left, on my right. We command that in Jesus' name. Someone said amen. Thank you guys. Tremendous job tonight. Tremendous. You may be seated. You may be seated. We are going to John chapter number four. John chapter number 4, while you were turning to John 4, we want to thank Zessa for the cooperation this week, amen, in advance. The Bible says, such only cometh out but by prayer and fasting. Apostle, don't worry, amen, God is in control. It's going to be all right, amen. You need to pray for your apostle, because I know hosting a meeting of this level, on this level, he wants everything to be okay. <clears throat> and... Uh, we are understanding. The people that are coming understand. Amen. But we pray that especially for Thursday night that it will be that it will be good for you. Amen. I know that uh, Doc will be. He's one of us in, from from Blair. He understands. Amen. But Thursday night we pray it will be very special for you on Thursday night, so that uh, we have good advertisements overseas when they speak of your church and your ministry. Amen. Thursday night, come supporting Apostle Matthew Ashmaloa. Come supporting uh, tomorrow night. Amen. We have an incredible man of God, a man of tremendous wisdom. 
I leaned over to Doc and I said to him, I said, you're such an incredible man. He said, ah, no, I'm an old horse. I said, those are the best, amen. So tomorrow you will support the church, you will support the ministry, amen. Registration is $2. You know when we were coming, I stopped over in Gueru because uh, we wanted a, a Nando's. It was about $8 for Nando's, isn't it? It was about $8 for Nando's chicken and chips and a Coke. $2 registration, you can't even buy chicken skin. <laughs> ah, yeah. So please register and support. It's important that you do. Pastors, don't just register for yourself. Register somebody else for your leaders. If you're a pastor in Beloya, don't just come by yourself so that you can make notes to preach on Sunday. Bring your congregation. There's nothing new under the sun, I'm telling you, amen. Bring your congregation. And of course, we want to thank uh, the Nyati's apostle, Colin and Sarah Nyati for hosting these meetings consecutively. He already told me that in December next year, they are back, you are back here. We commend you for that. May the Lord bless you abundantly. Somebody ought to say amen. amen. All right, amen. Uh, I spoke to Chi Chi several times today. And she wanted me to assure you that of her love and her commitment to you. Amen. All right, let's go to John chapter number four. My subject tonight is give me quality. Everyone say quality. You people must eat before you come to church. Say quality. quality. Amen. My heel is one dollar. <laughs> I need your prayers. Uh, I'm going to preach to you for about 50 minutes or so. I have to leave Bulawayo by not later than 9 o'clock tonight because I've got to catch the Kenya Airways flight that arrives in Harare at 1 o'clock. The flight leaves Harare at 2 a.m. I am traveling to Nigeria uh, at 2 a.m. this morning. So you, we need your prayers. Uh, if when the Holy Ghost falls, amen, and it's close to nine o'clock, I will leave you and the Holy Ghost to do your business. <laughs> amen. Jesus said, Lo, I am with you always. Kenya Airways will not be with me always. <laughs> amen. They'll leave me behind. Amen. <laughs> All right, John chapter number four for the third time. Verse number one, verse number three, verse number three. He left Judea and he parted again unto Galilee. And he said he must needs go through Samaria. He said, I must go through Samaria. Then comes he to the city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near a parcel of ground that Jacob gave his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was on that ground. Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, not from his journey, wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well. It was about the sixth hour of the day, sixth the number of man. And there comes a woman out of Samaria to draw water from Jacob's well. And Jesus said unto her, Give me to drink. For his disciples were gone away into the city to buy meat. In other words, they were changing their diet. Let's go now to Genesis chapter number 2 and verse number 21. Genesis is the first book in the Bible. Chapter 2 is probably page 3 in your Bible. <laughs> the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord had taken from the man made he the woman and brought her unto the man. So God arranged this marriage. 
And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore will a man leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. Father, help me tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. Everyone say quality. quality. Say that again. Let me just put this right so that our sponsors can see that we are supporting them. Everybody in the room has a past. Everyone say past. past. Say that again. Past. There's a past. What happened in the past, you can't change. What you have to do with when you're dealing with the past, you have to learn from it. You learn from what happened in the past. History has a habit of repeating itself. But if you learn from the past as a believer, you shouldn't make the mistakes of what others did in the past. We should learn from past mistakes. The past then determines our present, say present. Where we are in the past has brought us into our present. Some of us don't have a pleasant past. Our past has been very unpleasant. Some people here may have been abused, molested, assaulted. Uh, they may have been a vindictive environment you were in that subdued or subjugated you to tremendous pressures that have caused you to be the temperament and the, the structure that you are in your life. Some of our past is not easy. Some of us have had a, a, a different past, maybe a privileged past that has given us rights and privileges that others may not have afforded. But forgetting those things which are behind, we learn from those as we come into our present. Our present then is an interesting one because the present is we find ourselves here and now. Because you are here now, you have to deal with here and now. If you don't deal with your here and now, you are going to cause many problems for many in your life. So you have to resolve the fact that you are black or white, young or old, male or female. You have to resolve in your present what your past has delivered unto you. The present then is important because your present then, you have to learn how to make intellectual decisions. These are decisions that will determine your destiny. Many people are very impulsive when they make decisions. You should not make a destiny decision based on an emotional upset. You must always make destiny decisions based on counsel of people around you. First responders are family, and then those that God has meticulously placed around your life, if you are fortunate, to help you make a destiny decision. Everyone say past. Present. Say present. present. Say past. past. Say present. present. So you must make good decisions in your present. That includes the person you are choosing to live the rest of your life with in marriage. You never marry the person you can live with. You never ever marry the person you can live with. You marry the person you cannot live without. I cannot imagine my life without Chi Chi. I was watching the Nazis flirting with each other in the altar here. Colin cannot live without Sarah. Sarah cannot live without Colin. They are a perfect match. Therefore will a man leave his mother and father and cleave to his wife. You don't marry a person you can live with. People can cohabit. You marry your soulmate. You marry the person you cannot live without. So that's your present. The present then leads us to the future. Everyone say future. Say future. Say Macheu. Say future. future. Your future then is a second from now, a minute from now, an hour from now, tomorrow, next week, next month. Tomorrow is the 1st of December, 2010. Next year is 2011. That's the future. Everybody in this room has a future. It's the chronological unfolding of time. There is a future. Everyone say future. The first one is past. Say past. The decisions you make today determine your future. But life is a way, as believers, of creating a fourth, a fourth benefit for us as Christians. As Christians, we have not the future, but we have faith. Everyone say faith. faith. Say the past. Faith, then, is the substance of things hoped for. Faith will come and jump into your present to alter your future. 
Your future then is determined by the things you've decided today, but faith then jumps into your present to manipulate the present to give you a future. Faith then will determine what is called the future perfect. So you have the past, the present, the future. Then you have faith that comes into your present to determine your future perfect. So if you are going in your life and you take the wrong turn, faith can help you amend that turn to give you the future perfect. God then understands that your life is going on a designated way. Many times we don't see the end from where we are. We know that we are great in ourselves. We know that God has called us to do great things in whatever field God has called you in. In my case as a preacher, in your case as a business person, in someone else's case as a lecturer, someone else's case as a politician. God has then predetermined that future for your life. But some of the decisions we make in our present, based on our culture from the past, in inhibits our future. So faith then alters our present to give us a future perfect. Tell someone the future perfect. Say Macheo. Say the future perfect. You in the are angazi, angazi. So let's go through the five things again. It's a good lesson. When we're dealing with these dynamics, what God is looking for is quality. Someone say quality. Please say that again. Last night I gave you a table. Allow me to review that table very quickly. When you're dealing with the future perfect, especially when you recognize that you are a gifted person, many, many gifted people don't recognize that in their lives because of the things that have happened in the past. We arrive on the scene in life, we arrive on the scene of life already in a war, dealing with a very highly skilled, highly intellectual devil that is a psychologist, he is... Uh, a behavioralist, he's a primatologist, he's an anthropologist, he knows exactly how to manipulate you. So like Moses, he knows that you are a proper child from your mother's womb. He understands that you might be gifted in a very, very powerful way. So he'll cause your past with blood sacrifices, uh, altars of witchcraft, to inhibit your future, that when you come into your life, you find yourself in a struggle. As a young girl, as a young man, you are fighting unreasonable battles. You are fighting battles that are over your head and you don't understand why. That's because the devil is afraid of you. He's afraid of what you might become, who you might release from hell, the environment that you might change forever, the people that you might take from the clutches of hell and defeat, those that are hemorrhaging as a result of demonic attacks. He is afraid of what you can do. He's afraid of your ability. So if he can afflict you in your past, he can then inhibit your present. So many gifted people don't know they are gifted. So they start off with table number one. Low gift that has low anointing produces low results. Low gift, low anointing, low results. And then you start becoming vocalized. Your gift begins to increase and your anointing begins to increase. To where in the table of four things that I gave yesterday, your gift becomes great and your anointing becomes great and you produce great gifts. All of that is a process. Now, let's deal with what I call the J factor. The J factor is Joseph. 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 Let's go to Genesis chapter number 30 for this. Genesis 30. Verse 1. I'm going to preach in a minute. Let me just work out my case. Genesis 30, verse 1. Say, increase my gift. Say, increase my anointing. Say it with passion. Say that with power. Say that with thunder. When you see Matthew Ashimaloa here on Thursday night, don't think the man was always the way he is. He may tell you that he was raised in the middle of a village in the middle of Nigeria. His name was Ahmed. 
raised as a Muslim. That man's gift has been increased and his anointing has been increased. God is able to take a person that has a very volatile past and anoint them in a crazy way. So increase your gift and increase your anointing. Shout, increase my gift, increase my anointing. All the men shout. All the women shout. Thank you. <laughs> we now come to Genesis chapter number 30 verse 1. Help me, Holy Ghost. In Genesis 30 verse 1, when Rachel saw that she bare Jacob no children, Rachel envied her sister. Her sister was Leah. Why did she envy her sister? Because her sister was having kids. So let's go to Genesis 29 verse 31. Genesis 29 verse 31. The Lord saw that Leah was hated, so he opened her womb. But Rachel remained barren. Leah conceived, verse 32, she bare a son, named him Reuben. She said, surely the Lord hath looked upon my affliction, now therefore my husband will love me. Verse 33, she conceived again, bare a son, and she called his name Simeon. Simeon then means that the Lord has given me another son because I was hated. Verse 34, she conceived again and bare a son, and she named him Levi, and said, I will be joined to my husband because I have borne him three sons. She named him Levi. Verse 35, she conceived again and bare him a son, and she called his name Judah. She says, now will I praise the Lord, therefore his name shall be Judah. Now, the writer stops adding verses, because if he kept on adding verses, this girl would have been adding boys. <laughs> so Rachel, when she sees her sister producing, she becomes envious. She's jealous because her sister who is Leah. Leah, according to what we understand, the Bible says she was weak-eyed, which meant that she was a lower quality. But Leah now is producing every year. Boom, here comes another one. Boom, here comes another one. Boom, here comes another one. Here comes another one, boom. It's amazing how, if you are sometimes very gifted, it's amazing how people around you, somehow that are not doing half of what you do, Pray as much as you do. Give as much as you do. Are dedicated as much as you do. Yes, they are highly productive. Somebody who comes out of nowhere starts growing and you know that they haven't paid the price. You know it because you read it in the paper. <laughs> they haven't paid the price. Stop being silly. They haven't paid the price. <laughs> and so you see the Leah's producing. But you, you are trying and nothing is happening. God doesn't just want production. God wants quality. Anybody can have a baby. Anybody can start a business. Anybody can start a church. Anybody can preach. We have 66 books to choose from. They were telling me in Nigeria last week, I was in Nigeria with Bishop Michael Kwankwa. He was telling me that in Lagos, there are six, seven, even ten churches that start 